on the generation of God's Son in eternity. All life generates its offspring internally before doing so externally. And the more superior a life is, the more deeply within itself is the offspring it generates. Thus, vegetative life, so in trees as in animals, generates its seed, in one way in a tree, in another in an animal, within its own body, before either casting it out or generating an external tree or animal therefrom. Thus, sensitive life, which is superior to vegetative life, through its imagination, furnishes in itself an image and an intention for things before moving its limbs and shaping things in external matter. But the first offspring of the imagination, because it is in the soul itself, is for that reason closer to the soul than the offspring of vegetative life which is not made in the soul, but in the body. Thus rational life, which is above sensitive life, carries within itself the reason not only of things, but also of its very self before it brings its progeny, as it were, into the light, whether by speaking or acting. The first progeny of reason is closer to the soul than the progeny of the imagination, for the power of reason is reflected back onto its progeny, and through it, back onto itself. This the power of reason achieves by seeking, understanding, and loving itself and its action, something that the imagination does not achieve. Thus angelic life is above rational life. It produces within itself notions of itself, and of things by some impulse of God, before bringing them down into the matter of the world. This offspring is even deeper within an angel than reason's offspring is within it, because it is neither moved nor changed by individual external objects. For this reason, divine life, because it is the highest and most fruitful of all, generates offspring much more like itself than the rest, and generates it within itself before birthing it outside itself. It generates offspring, I repeat, by understanding just as God, by perfectly understanding himself and everything in himself, conceives the perfect idea of his entire self and from everything in himself, which is in fact the complete mirror image of God and the complete exemplar of the world above. This Orpheus called Pallas, who was born from the head of Jupiter alone. This Plato named the son of God the father, in his letter to Hermias. In the Epinomis, he dubbed it Logos, namely, reason, and word, saying, The Logos, most divine of all, has ordained this visible world. Mercurius Trismegistus often makes mention of the Word and the Son of God, and also the Spirit. Zoroaster also attributes intellectual offspring to God. Indeed, they said what they could, and even that was with the help of God. Only God, however, understands this, and whoever he wishes to reveal it to. The fertility of God, which is infinite good in actuality, extends itself infinitely from eternity in actuality by the nature of a boundless and eternal good. Whatever is outside of God is finite. Therefore, God extends himself in himself. Here certainly the infinite Son is of an infinite Father. It then follows that an offspring of this kind is innermost to God by a much greater degree, I would say, than the notion of an angel 
is to the angelic mind. In an angel, since being is certainly something other than understanding, the notion that is generated in the process of understanding is something other than the essence of the angel itself. In God, however, because being and understanding are the same thing, the notion that God begets by understanding himself is an image of his very self that is ever the most faithful. The Son is the same in essence as the very one who generates, although by the generation of some wondrous relation, he is distinguished from the one who generates. Finally, God, the infinite good, understanding himself from eternity through an eternal notion of this kind, breathes infinite love from eternity through the same notion in himself towards himself. Therefore, theologians call the Father and the Son and the Loving Spirit three persons, and they, by their divine nature, are a unity between themselves, such that God is one and simple, but they, the persons, do differ by some inconceivable relation. Thus we have two extremes in the order of things, and two middles. In any given angel, as some posit, one person is angelic in one nature of its species, and likewise for the opposite. In any given pregnant woman, however, there are more persons in more natures, and vice versa. In any given animal, there are more natures in one person, but in God, there are more persons in one nature. I have said enough of this for now, but never really enough. Attaining sufficiency in this contemplation is not to be sought from the philosophers, but from those heroic leaders of the Christians, and from God. For Isaiah rightly says, What the eye hath not seen, what the ear hath not heard, what hath not entered into the heart of man, God hath revealed to them that love him.